Hi listeners, I'm your host Camilla Pintos Lopez and this is Eternal Stories. This podcast series is brought to you by Southern Metropolitan Cemeteries, New South Wales. For more information about the cemeteries and the work they do, feel free to visit their website at www.smcnsw.org.au. We'd like to begin this episode by acknowledging the Bidjigal people of La Perouse from the Eora Nation, traditional custodians of the land, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners are advised that this episode will contain names of people who have passed. From the onset of Australia's colonisation, our history as a nation has been steeped in battles and bloodshed, in loss and victory for hundreds of years. More importantly, our First Nations people have been witness to and the subject of many since the very beginning, and as time has passed, have served as some of our greatest heroes. For every aspect of Australia's history, Indigenous Australians have played a part in it, not forgetting that they had a history long before British ships landed on the shores of Botany Bay. Today, our schools ensure that every generation that has followed has an understanding of the important role First Nations people have had in shaping the Australia we know today, including the not-so-nice parts of history, like war. Many of us are aware of the Indigenous soldiers that have fought in the World Wars, and if you've ever been to the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, for example, you would know of the dedication paid to Indigenous soldiers and their service. It's a part of our history that reflects a love for country during a time where these great heroes weren't even legally recognised as equal, let alone societally. And whilst we as a country today widely acknowledge the great bravery and sacrifice these men made, It's a lesser-known story I'm about to tell you, but by no means any less important. The Boer War, a conflict less discussed than its World War counterparts, was in fact quite a monumental part of our history. For one, it occurred 15 years before. Australian Federation hadn't even happened yet. And more interestingly, and yet often forgotten, our First Nations people enlisted to serve. It's an important truth to acknowledge that Indigenous voluntary military service had been taking place during this time, despite various barriers put in place trying to prevent it, not to mention the lack of benefits Indigenous soldiers received. Whilst this isn't the sole focus of the story, it's an integral piece of context that I would be remiss not to include, as a way of acknowledging some of the many barriers these brave soldiers had to overcome before they even set foot on a battlefield, and sadly had to continue to face after they returned home and were no longer in uniform. I honestly could not tell you why the Boer War, technically the Second Boer War, and Australia's involvement is lesser known. Maybe it's because it involved less empires or because the trigger was over diamonds and gold being found in present-day South Africa or because given the fact that Australia's federation hadn't taken place yet, our ancestors participated as representatives of various colonies and not as Australians. Whatever the reason, I can tell you the war lasted for two years, seven months and 20 days and amassed over 100,000 casualties, not including civilians ending in victory for the British and many stories for the history books. One man's story got a little bit lost for longer than I'm sure we'd like to admit, but thanks to the hard work and dedication of many, I'm able to tell you about a man called Jack, whose own hard work and dedication for country is simply incredible. This is his story. From the beginning of Jack's life, not much is known, and by from the beginning, I mean literally from the day he was born. Military historians like Peter Backer have dedicated countless hours into researching the lives of Australia's first Indigenous soldiers, and while their efforts have proven invaluable, 
there are still things today that remain a mystery. We do know that Jack was born in the year 1872 in the Braidwood area of New South Wales, a part of the Ewan people. He was the son of Alec Bond, sometimes also called Jack or Jackie, and Helen de Mestra, a woman of Aboriginal and French heritage. Jack was one of four children with brothers Andy, Joseph and William. Research indicates that Jack's family had strong roots in Braidwood, going back generations on both paternal and maternal sides. His paternal grandfather, also Jack Bond, was a well-respected Indigenous police tracker in the community, a skill that would prove to run in the Bond bloodline. There's not much to know about his earliest years, other than the fact that he grew up learning tracking skills, an extraordinary talent Indigenous people had passed down through generations in order to survive. Settlers recognised this ability as an essential and invaluable tool they could use to navigate the landscape. The British quickly realised that having the assistance of Indigenous trackers in police pursuits could vastly improve the outcome of their work. The truth is, for First Nations people, it was probably one of the only paying forms of work at the time that also earned the respect of European settlers within the community. Even though it is widely acknowledged that police trackers would often be required to use their skill to capture and displace their own people. By 1850, the New South Wales Police Force were actively working with trackers in various police districts. In 1867, it is recorded that 52 trackers were employed by the force and were instrumental in the capture of bushrangers. In fact, that very same year, infamous bushrangers the Clark brothers would be captured at Jindon near Braidwood with the help of trackers. It is said that Jack's grandfather may have even been involved in this successful pursuit. So it comes as no surprise that young Jack and his brothers would follow in the family footsteps and become a police tracker as well as a labourer for a time. It is believed he grew up without the ability to write, something that would prove quite interesting for historians when discovering his enlistment papers for the wars. Jack went on to voluntarily enlist for service and at the commencement of the Second Boer War, he was already a member of the Australian Horse. Regimental number 1603. The Australian Horse was, at the time, the only unit of the New South Wales military forces that had heavy cavalry, equipped with Martini Enfield carbines and cavalry sabres. However, as the Boers had no cavalry, the sabres were never used. The Australian Horse uniform prior to arrival in South Africa was described as a unique myrtle green colour complete with slouch hats with a black cock's feather, a mark of the New South Wales military forces. Even though Jack was already a part of the Australian horse, it was not assumed that he would be required to go into combat during war. So Jack volunteered to enlist with his unit and made his way to South Africa. He was a part of the second contingent and arrived in Cape Town on February 23rd, 1900 with something to suggest that he even brought his own horse. It would not take long before he was involved in action. By March 7th, he was fighting in the Battle of Poplar Grove. But as is the case with so many wars, fighting was not the only danger Jack would be subject to. The outbreak of typhoid that occurred during the war and was the cause of death for so many of his fellow soldiers was something Jack managed to avoid at first. The disease was actually so rampant amongst the soldiers that the war was paused for a period of three months at Blomfountain. On May 6, 1900, Jack left Blomfountain and travelled to Zand River, participating in the battle taking place there just four days later. But by September, a letter sent home conveyed that Jack had caught typhoid in Johannesburg and was inactive for three months. He was made to recover in Norville's Point, also a site of a concentration camp during the war. It is suggested, but not entirely clear, that due to his illness, Jack may have missed the falling of Pretoria on June 5th and the Battle of Diamond Hill on June 12th, both iconic parts of the war that saw the release of Australian soldiers from concentration camps after they had been captured 
six months before. It is clear that Jack recovered and remained in South Africa for a few more months, partaking in the battle in Belfast on Valentine's Day in 1901, Jack's final engagement on his first tour. On February 25th, his squadron was entrained at Middleburg and he returned home on May 2nd, 1901. As is the case with many soldiers, Jack's return to normal life as a labourer was a tough transition. Within a year, however, a new opportunity would present itself that would allow Jack to return to South Africa. By this point, Australia had officially formed under Federation and the Commonwealth had introduced its first unit, the first Australian Commonwealth horse. Jack enlisted on January 20th, 1902 this time in Sydney as a part of the Sea Squadron, number 356. Documentation recovered reveals that Jack enlisted under the name John Alec, although the motivation for doing so is not entirely clear. The squadron departed on the 18th of February 1902, nearly a year to the day that he had commenced his first trip home, and arriving in Durban one month and one day later on March 19th. Interestingly, the Australian Commonwealth horse would serve as the benchmark for the light horse deployed during the First World War, an indication that the inclusion of the Australian Commonwealth horse during the second tour of the Boer War was successful. The unit was, this time, armed with rifles and bayonets, a choice duplicated with the light horse unit years later. Jack spent many months in South Africa and was present when peace was declared on May 21st with the treaty signed 10 days later. The regiment was then ready to return home once more, arriving in Sydney on August 11th, 1902. For his service, Jack was awarded the Queen's South Africa Medal with Cape Colony and Dreyfontein clasps in June of 1901 by the Duke of York during his royal tour of Australia. It should be noted that the Duke of York would eventually become future king, King George V, just nine years later. However, it is interesting to note that historians suggest Jack should have received many more accolades for his two tours, including clasps for his involvement in the battles at Orange Free State, Belfast, Transvaal, Johannesburg and possibly Diamond Hill. He should have also been eligible to receive the King South Africa medal, with clasps for his tours in 1901 and 1902. He was also named in a newspaper article from the Queen Bee and Age on Wednesday 12th June 1901, noting his accolades. It is evident that Jack missed the sense of purpose he served during the war, volunteering once again in World War I with the Australian Imperial Force in 1918. But at the age of 46, he was considered too old to see action again and did not serve. The rest of Jack's life has been described by many as largely uneventful. It is known that he eventually moved to Sydney and had no children of his own. However, many relatives today have been connected through his mother, Helen. Jack passed away in 1941, with some reports that he was tragically hit by a tram in La Perouse, where he was living at the time of his death. What is known is that when he was buried at what is Eastern Suburbs Memorial Park today, his grave was unmarked and remained that way for decades. That is, until May of this year. It is very clear now that Jack's life, his service and his story is worth remembering. So much so that military historians and Indigenous communities continued for decades to try and put the puzzle pieces together so that we as a community now have a better understanding of the hero in the unmarked grave. It was through tireless efforts and community outreach, namely by the Jack Alec Bond Memorial Grave Committee under the chairmanship of Pastor Ray Minicon, that Eastern Suburbs Memorial Park was able to recommemorate Jack 
at a ceremony held on the ASMP grounds on May 31st, 2021, during National Reconciliation Week and on the 119th anniversary of the treaty being signed, signalling the end of the Boer War. The memorial service invited many people important to Jack's story to come together in commemoration, his extended family, fellow soldiers and community elders, tying all aspects of his life that appeared to be most dear. It is undisputed that his love for his people and his love for his country saw no bounds, and on one sunny winter's day in Sydney, people from all walks of life were able to pay tribute to the no longer forgotten trooper, currently the first known Indigenous serviceman to be presented with a medal for service in a foreign country, and the first to have served two tours actively. At the ceremony, respected community elders and servicemen alike gave speeches, Indigenous talent performed ceremonial dances, and a new plaque for Jack was unveiled. It reads, In memory of Trooper 1063-356, Jack Alec Bond, John Alec, a UN Aboriginal man from the South Coast, New South Wales. Born Braidwood area, New South Wales, circa 1872. Died Sydney, New South Wales, 4th of November, 1941. Boer War, South Africa. First Australian horse, January 1900 to May 1901. First Australian Commonwealth horse, February 1902 to August 1902. We hope you enjoyed the truly remarkable story of the life of Indigenous hero Jack Alec Bond. On our next episode, we'll be taking on a topic of a slightly different nature, sustainability with the two memorial parks and what that looks like, and the recent media interest on the subject. For more information on this episode and the podcast, feel free to head to our Facebook pages under Warrenora Memorial Park and Eastern Suburbs Memorial Park or on LinkedIn at Southern Metropolitan Cemeteries, New South Wales. Our website again is www.smcnsw.org.au. And of course, thank you for listening. Thank you.